Hello and welcome to My Security TV and our Tech and Sec Weekly. My name is Chris Cubbage. I'm the executive editor with My Security Media, and we're here on our second episode for the week, Tuesdays and Fridays. Uh, we do, do a live stream, uh, and today we've got John Carabin, Director of Cybersecurity for NTT Australia, and then we're going to be joined by Anthony Spatiri, who's in Perth, uh, and he's the Senior Global Technologist with Veeam and Veeam Software. So let me just walk through our slides and give you an introduction to what we do. We cover aerospace and space, defence and national security, cybersecurity and critical te technology. And today we're definitely covering off on those two. Uh, and then also cities and infrastructure. So we can pretty much cover off anything we like that's technology related. Just catch up on Tuesday. We interviewed Professor John Blaxlin, uh, Strategic and Defence Studies with the Australian National University. Uh, and he uh, really gave us good insights into the US Indo-Pacific strategy and some of those sort of big challenges that we face. Uh, so definitely check that out. And we also had uh, Philippe Orderard, uh, who was with Xtech uh, and their deal with uh, Milram Robotics uh, and their unmanned ground vehicles. So there's kind of two interviews in one episode. So check that out and that's available. And that's pretty much it in terms of what we've been doing. Uh, there's also uh, last week's episodes that I won't go on into. And then at the end of this session, we'll also look at some trends. There's about a 10% uh, prediction, sort of a 10% market increase in cybersecurity uh, from Canalys. And I'll walk through that report uh, and hopefully have John and Anthony uh, with us. Uh, in terms of the marketplace, uh, welcome to check it out. In terms of the events, uh, the cybersecurity masterclass is also still on. Uh, and there's a bunch of tech talks on next week. So the events are starting to come in for 2021. So let me bring in uh, John Carabin, and we're going to walk through the NTT monthly report from January. So there you are. G'day, John. How are you going? Good morning, Chris. I'm very well, thank you. And your Tuesday episode was fascinating and topical, I have to say. Happy Friday. To... Great. Thank And thank God it's Friday. So we have yeah, started <laughs> doing a, a Friday newsletter to the My Security TV subscribers, and... Yeah, it's always happy Friday. Thank goodness. I know. I know. Um, yeah, so John, uh, it's a pleasure to, to have you on. Maybe introduce yourself. You've uh, Most of the people in, in the industry will know, particularly here in Australia, but in the region. Uh, yep. You're head of cybersecurity for NTT. Uh, yeah. 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 In so, uh, so big title. Uh, what does it really mean? So I look after the strategy and sort of outward uh, facing business for NTT, NTT Australia. And of course, um, a long heritage uh, here in Australia through our previous company, Dimension Data. We, we changed names about a year and a half ago. That's where, okay. In our pre-interview, it was like, where, where had we crossed paths? It was Dimension Data, so there you it go. Dimension Data, you know, it's a very well-known brand in Australia, of course, and uh, I think over 2,000 employees, and uh, they've been acquired by NTT, uh, the big telco, uh, some years ago, but uh, yeah. finally together as a sort of a single entity. So very exciting times, uh, constant change in the industry. And um, yeah, my job's really to look after our outward facing uh, all our clients effectively. Uh, I've got about 150 dedicated security specialists in the team uh, yeah. with all sorts of skills scattered around the country. Um, and we really focus on, if I was to simplify it, it's the secure by design approach. So everything that we deploy has to have cyber you know, best practice security uh, involved. Some of that's really pure play. So we do do managed security services and we've got yeah. consulting services, uh, instant response and so on. But but more frequently now it's it's combined with all the other services, network, data center, you know, cloud and so on. So very big remit, uh, changes almost every day for us at the moment. So it uh, keeps me very busy. And you're head of that. So you mentioned, was that 120, was it 120? Uh, about 150. 150, uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I like to think the family's much bigger than that because everyone from our sales and, you know, support teams, they're all involved in one way or the other. So yeah. uh, uh, I like to think of it being a much bigger team, but uh, they're the dedicated ones. Very good. And just uh, for if, for those people that are watching and listening, we should be live on Facebook, YouTube and on LinkedIn. So welcome to uh, come in with any particular questions or say good day from wherever you are in the world. John, maybe just introduce us to NTT as a company, because then I think that'll allow sort of us to understand the scale of those 150 staff. So yeah, yeah a bit of background to NTT and the main services and the drive, and then you provide those internal cybersecurity as well, as well as external to the clients? Not internal, so we have a specialized team. Got it. I would not want to do, do that uh, job. That's a real job, right? 
That's a real job. That's a big job in its own right. Although, you know, I do talk to those uh, that team very frequently. Uh, so yeah. we do connect a lot. But look, NTT, uh, most people would know them. They're, they're, one of, they're in the top five ISPs, uh, one of the largest telcos. Um, you know, and the mission is effectively to connect people and businesses securely. And, uh, yeah. you know, I put a capital S on that secure. It's become a big part of it. Uh, there are many, many companies in the entity family, um, but security is a core competency and um, they've rightfully sort of arced that out as a specialist uh, part of the organisation. Uh, and it's a global organisation, so um, it yeah. involves things like security operating centres. So we have nine uh, in all the major centres around the world. You've got one here in Australia? We have one here in Australia. Actually, we have two. We have a specialised one for government. Uh, obviously, okay. there's some very special requirements around it. Um, we also have a commercial grade one based in Sydney, actually, uh, that's yep. connected to all the other uh, global uh, security operating centres. And the other SOC's in Canberra, was it the government one? Well, the other one's in Canberra, yeah, as right. you can imagine, you know, a very secure uh, facility, yep. of course. Yeah. And what type of team are you, what's your direct reports, just as a head of cybersecurity with 150 there? Yeah. How have you structured that out of interest? Yeah, so we work in the world of uh, matrix and uh, you know cross sort of um, cross connections between the business. Um, they are everyone from the technical capability. So you know an important part for our business is understanding the fabric of how things connect together. So uh, some of them will be uh, the the engineers and that that know how to uh, deploy the the technology, and some of it's security technology. Um, you know firewalls, intrusion detection, all those sort of things. But frequently, it's the uh, it's the network equipment. So specialists that know how to configure SD WAN securely, yeah. specialists that know how to connect uh, workloads into a hyperscale cloud provider. Um, so there's a lot of engineers and capability in that space. Uh, we have a group of specialist security consultants um, setting strategy, doing roadmaps, penetration tests, red teams, and that's become a growing area for us. And so we've got a you know dedicated consulting group. Uh, we have some uh, some of the key partners, and cyber is all about partnerships. Uh, you yep. know, with the technology partnerships. So we work with some of the best known top partners uh, globally, and also working with local Australian cybersecurity uh, companies. Um, and any, uh, any standout any standout partners? Who who would be your main sort of partners in in that uh, field in terms of cybersecurity? All of all of the ones you'd imagine, so the Palo Altos, the Cisco's, the FireEyes, the Checkpoints. Um, I'll get in trouble for mentioning any, <laughs> you know. So, um, but but a lot of those sort of top tiers. We also, by the way, work with um, some small Australian startups. Um, uh, you know, and we we actually are a, a founder of Cyrise, for example. I noticed that. that the other day, actually, mm -hmm. uh, and we'd already reached out to you, but yeah, uh, uh, with Cyrise, NTT, uh, and Deakin University there. Yeah, no. So that's been going on. That's three, four years in the in the uh, running now. Um, we started it when we were in Dimension Data. We've continued to support it. Yep. Uh, we put funds in to help uh, pre startups. Uh, this is pre Series A and B uh, organized or teams that want to form companies. Uh, and uh, Sarais is a fantastic accelerator, actually, to sort of form that. I think they're on to their twelfth organization now. Yeah, but I think they've just uh, in, put inv invitations out for their fifth cohort. Yeah, so they have. So if anyone wants to go into LinkedIn, you can have a look and uh, certainly recommend the program. It's a fantastic program to sort of get to the next stage. Very good. So look, one of the things that uh, grabbed my attention, I'm just going to bring my slide back up and then sort yeah. that out. Hang on a second. Um, was the endpoint device evasive attack stages. So I'm getting the NTT monthly threat reports. Maybe talk us in, you've got a, a GTIC, Global Threat Intelligence Center. Yep. Yeah, yeah so, maybe talk us through so, these reports. So the GTIC, <laughs> Global Threat Intelligence Center, uh, they're our specialist research uh, team. They're, they're the tip of the spear for us. Um, they, they are a dedicated research group that gather threat intelligence effective in the cyber industry. Um, they're connected to all our SOCs. Uh, we also have seven research labs around the world, big research, oh. you know, they're honey pots, uh, they research um, uh, botnets and all sorts of interesting things. Uh, they're connected to a whole bunch of uh, alliance groups like the Cyber Threat Alliance, uh, Microsoft's uh, Digital Threat, uh, Digital Crimes Unit, Estopol, whole bunch of things, uh, all feeds into this group and they really predict 
uh, threats. They produce these monthlies. They produce uh, an annual report, which is a fascinating read. Uh, they also produce a uh, almost a daily, sometimes it's two or three times a day, a vulnerability report. So we get uh, flashes uh, depending on what you know new vulnerabilities are hitting, which are which are literally daily at the moment. Yeah, um, it's pretty. So and uh, they they write a lot of this material that comes out. Okay, much impact locally. Have you seen with the solar winds uh, breach? Yeah, you know, interestingly, uh, so we're running campaigns at the moment for detection of solar winds. So we've got uh, we're running uh, we're, uh, analysis of a lot of our clients to see see what's happening. And I thought there'll be nothing in Australia because uh, I just assumed that it was you know largely US centric. Um, but speaking to our analysts just two days ago, uh, they were saying that we are seeing indicators of attempts to use the IOCs. So yeah. uh, what this shows us constantly is that there are a lot of copycats. It doesn't necessarily mean the nation states that have hit the US agencies are, are yeah. acting, yeah. but those indicators, the moment they're published, they get they get picked up and they get formed into all sorts of new tools and then they get uh, tested. And we have seen uh, indicators of those indicators being tested here in Australia and up through Asia as well. So there's stuff going on in that space. Very interesting. Any idea you might have insight? You probably don't know in terms of right now, but the insights where those uh, sort of uh, tentacles might lead back to. Look, um, it's always it's probably not our remit to to do the attribution. I'll, I'll leave it to the the nation states themselves <laughs> to figure that out. They're pointing figures at each other uh, yeah. as as we speak. What I will say though is. Um, these secondary attacks we're seeing, that there are clearly other nation states using them, um, not right. surprisingly. But we're also seeing the the kids down at the local uni uh, uh, also try them out. So, you know, the, it's great that we publish these indicators and there's bulletins coming out from uh, ASD here all the time. Yeah. Yeah. The moment those bulletins come out, though, uh, it's a free for all. And we see Absolutely. the level right up to the most sophisticated level or testing it out. Yeah, yeah. The ACSC released a high alert on that uh, last week, early last week, if not the week before. I think we covered it uh, very briefly. Yeah. Um, so, look, t let's talk us through. I'm going to just bring this slide up just so the audience can see it clearly. In fact, I'll have to get rid of your name there briefly. Yep. Right. Um, so, this was in uh, the January 2021 monthly threat report, and again, we've. We post these uh, on to the My Security Marketplace as well as a resource uh, when uh, I see, when they come across my desk. Yep. Maybe just talk us through the evasive attack techniques and sort of the background to what was being observed here on endpoint devices. Yeah, yeah. and look, this is a uh, evasive attack techniques, EAT, or sometimes uh, advanced uh, evasive techniques um, are a particular genre of uh, a technique. Um, they are uh, absolutely categorized by the fact that they're stealthy, they're uh, hard to detect, and they're very effective. And uh, these four stages sort of describe why. Um, but what's really interesting is they're in play as we speak. Uh, uh, SolarWinds is an example of this particular uh, type of approach, this method, if you like. Starts at the endpoint, typically. Endpoint being your laptops that we're, we're using now, the servers, uh, you know, the smartphones and so on. And um, you know that's the that's the beginning point. Classically, it's email, so no surprise phishing. And yeah. everyone has seen, you know, 70, 80 percent of the entry points are coming through email. Uh, so that's a hint as to where to start to defend. Uh, but also web and browsing, uh, and we've seen a lot of examples of, uh, you know, watering holes and other ways of luring the user uh, to start to activate um, malicious code. Um, the trick, however, uh, and the difference with this is that activation of malicious code doesn't trigger alerts. And the key uh, thing is, of this is not actually triggering the standard controls and alerts that uh, are used to defend. It was very interesting. I, I was looking at something yesterday about that where it was a uh, came across no detection was able to pick it up yeah. because it was looking like a le legitimate update and just sat there yeah. uh, as a beacon exactly. as, as at the end of the day uh, yeah. until it was uh, activated. Yeah. Yeah, so if someone in a company legitimately opens an email and legitimately activates, uh, a, you know, an application because of that, which is the way it was designed to work, yeah. then it's very hard to detect. And it was a course, DLL file. Yeah, the DLL files are, you know, fundamental to how to how uh, the world works, and yet there's so many vulnerabilities attached to them. I think the the point is they the the actors get in. 
But unlike perhaps the old fashioned ransomware where they just detonate and you know things go yeah. off, yeah. in the in the evasive world, they don't detonate. They establish a point of presence. They they really uh, settle into the environment and they start to do reconnaissance. And that reconnaissance is learning uh, what's going on. And that's sort of the next stage, which is this uh, downloading of more malicious files. Now these are often very carefully crafted. You know they're hidden inside. Uh, big binaries that are very difficult to detect. They know that AI and machine learning is scanning incoming files, so they, you know, they're acting against that. So to, to actually um, uh, create diversion, if you like, when these these files come through. But from that point, uh, you know, the, the the trap has been set, um, and they start doing the next stage, which is that sort of living off the land. LOT. L binaries, uh, the, another beautiful acronym, but it's effectively, <laughs> it's, it's one of the biggest acronyms in our industry, actually, so I love it. Um, but, uh, you know, it is it is a process of using tools that are freely accessible. It's it's the power shells, you know, it's the um, uh, the net users scheduling tasker, uh, even um, uh, cybersecurity tools, Mimikatz and... Um, yeah. The one that's been used by SolarWinds uh, seems bizarre, actually, that they've used Cobalt Strike, for example, which is a red team, standard red team tool. Um, but it's not bizarre because, A, these are standard tools. They obfuscate um, attribution. So, firstly, you don't know who's using them. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is they often don't trigger the alerts because PowerShell, for example, is used by network administrators to, to maintain the user's machines. It's very hard to turn those sort of things off. But they can be very very uh, useful. Um, living off the land then goes to the next stage, which is that effectively lateral movement and really establishing, um, you know, a base of operations. Um, the lateral movement is, signif is, is um, you know, an important stage simply because they start to then escalate privileges at that stage. And that's the name of the game is escalated privileges, get as much access as you possibly can broaden the, the scope of where you are inside the enterprise uh, for two reasons. One is there's a mission, and usually that mission is exfiltration. Um, yep. In the yep. nation state, you know, it's it's secrets. In the case of, case of ransomware, as we're seeing in the latest ransomware, it's sensitive data that they use as a further leverage uh, before they detonate the actual encryption uh, technologies. But that's what they're trying to do, uh, and it is that escalation of privileges that, that we see time and time again, but at a very subtle, slow, methodical, you know, uh, approach. So what hope is there, I suppose, at the end of the day when when even the cybersecurity companies are getting breached uh, themselves yeah. and, you know, there's still a lot of fallout to come from this, particularly, say, in the US, and, yeah. you know, you talk about lateral movement and escalation of privileges, you just don't know how far and how no. many other beacons are out there. No. Um, so, no. yeah, what, what's some of the, the key advice that you've got? Because I don't know if I'd want a job of head of cybersecurity <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> and advising clients right now, other than just turn yeah. off everything yeah. from the internet. Don't, don't, use the internet. don't connect to the internet, it's our first advice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, look, uh, but yeah, we try to say don't abandon hope. <laughs> uh, it, you know, there is there is there is mechanisms for for uh, dealing with this. Is it is it the zero trust uh, and the micro segmentation as sort of the yeah. key aspects now? Yeah, look, zero trust is going to be a twenty twenty one theme. Uh, it is increasingly demonstrating the attributes of what what you need. Um, you know, it looks at that concept that you can't trust your your inner network. And, and that's been the problem. Um, so much of our security uh, defense has been based still on the perimeter, the moat, and mm -hmm. um, uh, th these evasive techniques get in and then use the vulnerabilities internally. I mean, SolarWinds, some of the techniques being used were vulnerabilities um, around as applications that just hadn't been patched. And I can tell you, you know, practically, we talk to many clients, they don't bother patching necessarily inside the network because they you know it's just priorities and they're they're patching the firewalls and the external facing things but to get inside it's just too much effort no one will get in anyway why do we need to bother um so they're they're the rules of of the uh, evasive uh techniques um and you can use those same rules though to start to defend um i'd be negligent to say the first and, th and foremost approach is uh awareness and education uh, now we overuse that term and it's not a complete defense. Um, you cannot stop people clicking uh, because 
Evasive techniques rely on the fact they've already got the email accounts and yeah. you know, it is John Carabin sending Chris a, an email and you will naturally open it because you know who I am. Um, that is very hard to prevent. I mean, I just don't think you can do that. But for me, awareness is in that fact that it's okay to call your security person. And I do. I call our security folk internally all the time with stupid questions. Uh, or, look, I just saw this. Is this a problem? Uh, and they've got to be open and aware. I think the other thing we've also learned, and, and, and I can attest to this uh, over recent uh, maturity assessments that we've done, uh, playbooks are not being kept up to date. So I don't think the security teams are, are doing enough training or, or awareness. Um, you know, a six month old playbook inside an organization is is out of date. Wow. The environment has already changed. COVID's pushed that, you know, so many companies are working from home, but they haven't adapted how, how their security models are, are operating. They've moved things to the cloud, Azure and AWS, but they, they can't monitor and you know the as well as they could uh, previously. Do you think they're being resourced? And is it a resourcing issue, a time issue? Because we talk about awareness, but if they can't keep their playbooks, if they're not uh, patching internal uh, applications, yes. and you know, and then also monitoring you know the environment because it is changing so fast. Yeah. And security is always you know we've been around for a while. Corporate security, uh, you know, even pre sort of internet was always a cost center and it's yeah. it's just not seen as as critical no. business and no. you, you i think you mentioned it, i think it was maybe pre-interview where your role was uh, security by design you've got to get security in there no. um for clients it's it's yeah. a really hard one i mean it's just basic yes. stuff but i just yes. still think it it's, it's a security mindset that most people just don't understand no, and look, it does have to be ingrained. And so that secure by design approach, I think, is really important. Uh, it is changing, though. I think security now is being perceived as a business enabler more and more. And uh, I know our own internal security teams constantly think of how can we make sure that this enhances the business, works in with the mission of the company, connect, uh, but also make sure that our clients and our internal people stay secure. So yeah. Yeah. that's a mind shift uh, change. I can tell you budget wise, you know, just talking about my business in Australia, security hasn't been tightened as much as IT, certainly IT budgets at the moment are being tightened. Security has remained constant or grown a bit, uh, which right. you know, we'll take. Uh, but you're right, resources is a constant problem. Uh, show me a company that's got enough resources and I'll show you one that's got too much money. Um, yeah. You know, it's just, just not realistic. And even when they've got the funding, they can't find the skills. And there's, I know there's a lot of debate whether it's, there is a skill shortage. There is because uh, it's, it's the markets varying. And I, I can tell you one area that we're seeing opening up, and that's in the application security space. Right. And finding people that understand the application world in the, the new, you know, the cloud environment is really hard to find these days. Finding people that have OT experience but are a security mindset is hard to find at the moment. So it depends on the, the niche. Yep. But Yes, they're important. But yeah, there's no shortage of probably GRC type of approaches, but it is, and as you say, applications are changing. That technology is changing quite rapidly too. Yeah. And you've also got that, the uh, AppSec analytics, the sort of the um, the forensic approach uh, to that is also a real science in itself. And it's a discipline that you have to dedicate yourself yeah. to. Hence, hence it is that. It is a massive difference. Um, yeah. What are you seeing in terms of OT security? Do you think there's a bit of an uptake, and particularly say after the Australian cybersecurity strategy and their sort of bit more focus on critical infrastructure? And we we ran some OT uh, IT security or cybersecurity workshops a couple of years ago now, and I kind of struggled to get some interest. We did get some good interest, but not really broad market interest, and then. Uh, sort of the last 12 months, I'm hearing a lot about OT uh, cybersecurity. So where, where do you see that trend? It's definitely growing. Um, we're, we're definitely seeing a, an uptick in the in inquiries and the reaching out for assistance. We're involved in a couple of uh, energy organisations and interestingly, a couple of mining companies as well. Uh, yep. Very similar sorts of structures. I'll tell you a funny thing. SolarWinds, you know, everyone's gone, holy you know, this is really, yeah. this is really, this supply chain thing, you know, how has this happened? This happened 10 years ago, uh, a, a technique, Dragonfly attacked 
you know, was was supply chain attack to OT uh, con uh, command uh, control systems for uh, oil and uh, energy. So, you know, we've gone a real cycle in terms of uh, how dangerous this is, and I think people are waking up to it. The the connection between the IT IP world and the you know the the skater and control systems world is is really starting to speed up, and so that's why we're seeing that uh, that increase. I think governments focus on the impact that can occur to what we define as critical infrastructure, and they're expanding that now, which yeah. is which is great. You know, health's being brought into that remit as well, and they have OT and IoT yeah. requirements as well. Uh, that's the universe, the cyber universe that's growing. Uh, we, we're um, we've we've employed a engineer out of uh, a mining company uh, to help us with our security OT strategy. We yep. want people to understand how that works. Well, that's how. In fact, it was interesting. That's who we had coming to the courses. Really, was the process engineers uh, yeah. were coming because they knew they could see that there was a risk. Uh, and in fact, we had full teams where the cyber security and and the process engineers came along. Uh, and as a group, they, you know, what they see a vulnerability there and they all look at each other going, holy, you know, yeah. wow. So we've got yeah. to patch that or, or fix that straight away or, yeah. or disconnect it. Um, so, look, it is a real challenge. Uh, if they're not getting it right in an IT environment, uh, God help us in that OT environment with PLCs laying around yeah. Uh, yeah. with uh, post-it notes with their, <laughs> their login details stuck to them. So, look... Um, John, thank you so much. Oh, Anthony, I saw him in the background and he's just ducked off. Here he is. He's, he's coming back. Okay. I'm going to, we're going to uh, hand over now to, to Anthony Spatiri. John, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I'll put you backstage, but stay on. And I'm not seeing any chat. So if anyone's got any questions, uh, but I think I'll bring you on when we look at the Canalys uh, report and their trends with cybersecurity. Uh, and then I think um, we might finish off. It's a really good insight, particularly from an industry perspective in terms of those skills, uh, application security and OT security uh, as some skill sets. Uh, but thank you so much for your time and uh, I'll bring you back on shortly. Thanks, John. Okay, let me just get over the slides here. And so if you are happen to be watching, uh, let us know or press like, just so I know that the system's actually working. And because I don't see any chats, uh, but then people do tell me that they're watching. So there you go. Now we're gonna bring on Anthony Spatiri uh, and we're gonna look at Veeam software and also DNA Next Gen storage technology. And here he comes. Anthony, thank you very much for joining us. Good morning, how are you doing, Chris? Welcome to, uh, from Western Australia, good on you. Nice and early, all good. Yeah, <laughs> look, it's not too bad. Uh, daylight uh, saving here in WA makes us three years, uh, three, yeah, three years, some will say <laughs> almost, that. <laughs> almost. Uh, three hours ahead of Perth, so appreciate you getting up a little bit earlier. All good. Um, Anthony, you've got a great title. We had a quick chat yesterday as well, Senior Global Technologists. Uh, not quite a futurist, but definitely uh, we'll end, we're going to end up talking about that. Maybe uh, introduce your role uh, with Veeam and we'll have a bit of a chat about Veeam as well. Yeah, no worries. Thanks. Chris. So, yeah, the, the role is interesting. I've struggled to explain it on my first sentence, but effectively what I get to do in, in normal course is um, go around the world and you know, basically evangelize the great technology that Veeam has um, at a lot of the conferences, speak to our key customers, um, but also what the function of the product strategy team in the office of the CTO is, is to basically act as a conduit between our customers, our sales force, and then our R&D department. So, you know, kind of that loopback mechanism to get features and enhancements into the product um, that our customers want. So it's a really cool uh, job. Um, hopefully in the next couple of months, we can start to get back to doing what we love. But, you know, we've been able to pivot quite well. And I love doing these virtual events as well on these online podcasts. Right. And odd. GC, uh, thank you very much for saying uh, g'day. Uh, you're live, great content. Thanks, mate. Um, so we, with your role, how, how sort of product facing are you? I noticed, uh, had a look yesterday, and we've got Veeam on the marketplace too, by the way. So we've got the Veeam availability suite, the Microsoft uh, suite and the backup and recover uh, products as well. So people can make an inquiry on there uh, from the marketplace itself. And hence, you know, taking a bit more interest in Veeam and, and what you're doing. Um, yeah, I noticed you do like podcasts and a bunch of other things as well. How how much influence do you have on the product itself? Were you there as just a 
deal with those clients and the partners as well and, and where the product is, is getting developed? Yeah, so my background's in service providers. So I worked pretty much all my, well, actually all my career in service provider space. I worked at a leading uh, sort of VMware vCloud provider in Australia beforehand. Um, so my focus in the product strategy team is actually on the service provider products and features. So absolutely talking and engaging specifically with service providers, it really allows us to basically get into the product some specific features. So if I look at our previous release, which was V10, uh, we're actually on the cusp of a V11 release um, some of the enhancements are direct interfaces that I've had with customers talking to our R&D. So it's pretty cool to be able to sort of influence product at that level. So the short answer is yes. Um, it just depends on, you know, how much of an actual want and requirement it is and if R&D can actually get it done in that time frame as well. So, yeah. How much, yeah, so you kind of give them a, a sort of a market appraisal of, of what you're seeing as well and then also the feedback from the clients. Let's sort of get a segue going with uh, we're going to talk about next gen storage technology and the use of DNA and almost that sort of biological um, mm. part of computing that's expanding. Um, your storage, your backup and recover, uh, where do you see that? So as out of that sort of product suite or software suite that Beam has, where, where are some of the strengths from the market that you see? Because I imagine that backup and recover is a, a critical aspect. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's funny. If, if we think about the analogy of a platform, when I started at Veeam, backup and replication was effectively one of maybe four or five actual products that we have. Now we've got, I think I've lost count, but we've got well over 10 now, probably 12 to 13, and it's part of a, of a platform. So this, this is how we describe it now, right, the, the cloud backup platform. Um, and that encompasses all sorts of tech from, you know, cloud, um, we've got physical, virtual, obviously, which is where we started riding that virtualization wave that VMware built significantly over the past sort of 15 years. Um, and more recently, last year, we acquired a company called Kasten, which is um, backup for a Kubernetes environments, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, we're really spread out now, but at the core of it is still backup and replication. And, you know, the majority of our, of our revenue still comes from that particular product. And it's become, well, it always has been very steady very reliable um, and very simple as well as a backup product. And that's why I think Veeam has been quite successful because at our core, backup and replication has just done the job really well. How do you, where, where do you find yourselves in, in the Australian market? You, you have a global role. Hmm. Um, where, where's Veeam in Australia in terms of, of its teams? I, I take it in all cities or mainly Melbourne, Sydney? Uh, actually, all across, actually. So, you know, I think, so ANZ is the biggest um, region within APJ. Um, it was the first region, actually. So um, the head office in APJ was actually out of Sydney for, actually out of um, Manly, would you believe, for, right. um, a quite, for quite a while. We've obviously shifted that into Singapore now. It's led, led by Sean McLagan, our senior vice president out of, um, out of Singapore for APJ. However, within ANZ, it's still a great focus. And actually, our CTO, Danny Allen, um, loves the ANZ region because effectively, as you would know, a lot of the initial sort of testing and innovation for new technologies is kind of sort of bred within ANZ as a, as a leading sort of edge for the world. And then it kind of pops out from there. So ANZ is significant for us. Um, you know, we cover, uh, we've got Brisbane, Melbourne, Sydney, um, obviously not, I don't think we've got offices in Adelaide and South Australia, but certainly Perth as well. So we cover most of the country and there's over a hundred employees uh, in Australia alone for them. Nice. So it's grown quite significantly. Okay. Um, where is, you said men mentioned version 11. Uh, I had two, I had another question in my mind was also the, any sort of market trends that you are seeing with uh, sort of COVID and how companies sort of responded, because I don't know how much of an impact that would have had on uh, Veeam and, and sort of an uptake on its on its services, because most yeah. of the, the activity was around networking and remote yeah. remote access. So any, any impacts and market trends that you're seeing? Um, certainly, I think what's happened over the past 12 years is in, incumbencies are winning a lot more. So obviously, the, the, the sort of first to replace technologies of whether it be software or hardware is kind of reduced because that's seen to be risky. So we've done quite well out of that. We've got quite a significant customer base already, um, over 400,000 customers, communally speaking. So I think that was one. So we actually had a really good year last year, which was, you know, I think 
uh, well, well, surprisingly, not surprising. I think we've always done pretty well. We've been on a really good trajectory. But that was the biggest trend that I saw is that, you know, incumbents just wanted to stay status quo. Um, certainly, we had some quite big wins. It, it was all based on what we can do. Across, again, I've mentioned the platform. If you can show as a backup and data protection company that you can basically not only cover the traditional uh, physical virtual, but actually start to go into, say, Office 365, um, you know, that cloud native, that's what customers want to see moving forward. Now, they might not be using that, especially in a Kubernetes space. Um, we found, I found personally, I was getting asked questions a lot around Kubernetes, but the reality is that it was just sort of feeder questions. We might be looking to do it, but what's your plans on it? So yeah, we're, we're really strongly placed for that moving forward. I think, yeah, it is a good thing to know that there are security related products there for those environments before you go there. There's no point uh, sort of moving into a new environment uh, from a Dev, DevOps perspective and then thinking about security afterwards. You really want to be able to planning that before. So look, um, we had a chat, we got off, uh, off um, uh, topic yesterday and we started talking about general technology, but this is a fascinating area and it wasn't until uh, you raised it with me that I had a look and bit on YouTube as well on DNA storage technology. Microsoft and IBM are in this big time. Uh, so let's uh, talk about DNA, next-gen storage technology, and where this is all all heading. And there's a lot, uh, and we are going to be covering off on semiconductors in a couple of weeks and yeah. quantum computing. So it touches into that uh, as well. So DNA, I've got one image, Anthony, just so yeah, this yeah. was off a, I wasn't going to play the video. Uh, this is a Microsoft and you, uh, UW demonstrate the first fully automated DNA data storage. Ah, I think that's it. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll put the link in there. But talk us through DNA storage technology and, and where this is heading. I think you've sort of marked off data centers uh, are going to be obsolete eventually, right? Yeah, if they all look like that, I think it would be quite interesting though, right? This is a quite interesting data, data center. Right? Yeah. I've seen some interesting ones, but never like that. Um, no, I think, look, D DNA is interesting. And, 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 you know, but putting it out there, I mean, this is something that um, my coworker, Michael Cade, has been quite passionate on and doing the research on. And, you know, I've, I've picked it up and I've got some different thoughts, you know, from a futuristic point of view. But I think um, if you look at DNA, those are no DNA. It's based on just sets of data, right? It's combinations of letters that create... Um, effectively the genetic code for us. We continually store our DNA, it gets generated, it's very resilient. Um, so from a resiliency point of view, um, you know, you think about our existing um, sort of storage methodologies, tape, um, you know, even cassettes in the old days, even SSDs, they, they all kind of degrade over time, right? DNA survives the test of time and, you know, we've been able to dig into DNA from millions and millions of years ago. So I think that's an interesting one. And just the fact that it does store something in some way, the scientists have obviously seen something there, right? Um, now, this, now, just to clarify, I don't think this is a case of actually storing um, our backup within ourselves, you know, storing it within our own DNA, right? Because our DNA sequencing is all done. It's kind of growing and evolving as, as from the time we're born until we die, right? This is more about taking the theory of what it looks like in DNA, DNA-based storage, ultra compact, easy to replicate, uh, thanks to its primary role in creating life, right? So I think that's it. So, you know, when you look at it, I think um, one big advantage of it, it has two big advantages. One is that a DNA strand could potentially hold 455 exabytes now that's by tons more data than what we've got created in the world today which is quite exciting when you think about that as well um because an exabyte is up there you know with with all those weckers and zettas and all that kind of jazz um and then again it's all about the resiliency of it as well so you've got massive potential for super super um storage capacity but also longevity as well so that's one of the big things i think and that's why the, the guys like microsoft are looking at it the other one I, I looked at was they rather than the zeros and ones, they put it into the DNA letters and the strands, and that's where they get that massive uh, sort of uptake and how they can read and read and write to it as well. Yeah. Uh, really interesting in terms of how they're breaking it down between the molecular and sort of the wet and dry electronics. Where where do you see what's the sort of the roadmap for this from what uh, you've been seeing? You know, how how sort of applicable will this become and what's yeah. that time frame well it's been it's been improving over time but i think so if i'm 
probably putting two and two together, what you're seeing on the screen there in that picture was the actual um, test bed for um, a little experiment that I had where they were trying to use it um, experimentally, right? So um, what they did there is they tried to encode a five byte hello into the DNA. Now they did that and they were able to encode it and read it back. Now the problem was it took 21 hours to basically code and encode five bytes, right? Um, and when you think about the data being created today, you know, this, uh, you know, 300 terabytes of data Twitter is, is creating, uh, there's 300 million tweets mm. a day on Twitter, right? Um, a lot and, less and, now that Trump's off it, but oh, uh, a yeah. A little bit less, yeah. <laughs> they lost quite a few last week. I lost a few, <laughs> few people as well. I wondered there. Um, but 300 million times that by 160, you know, characters, that's a lot of data just when you think mm. about that. And then uh, everything else, all the people creating the data and backing up their data. So to do five bytes within 21 hours, it's not there yet. But when you think about DNA, genome sequencing, and all that kind of stuff, yeah, they started that, what, 20 years ago? It cost 100 mil. Actually, even in 2001, it cost $100 million to basically sequence the genome, and it took a long time. And it actually took years before it got to that. So today, you can basically do a kit, do a swab, and you'll get it back in two days. It'll cost about $1,000, right? Yeah. So you know, from in 20 years, we've gone from $100 million to 1000 and the time, you know, 20 years to basically two days. So it's not quite there, but I think that from my perspective, and we talked about it yesterday, from a pure technologist, futurist point of view, it's quite a romantic um, idea to think that, you know, over the next 20 to 50 years, we could be storing it within DNA technology. And storage is a game changer. Once you can start to store, then you can start to recall it, analyse it, so all of that sort of the real value of that data, the more you can store, because uh, we really, that, that's where the world is right now. We want to store everything. Nothing is deleted anymore. No. Uh, everything we do <laughs> is yeah. being recorded. This is a live recorded stream, by the way. Um, everything that we do. So nothing's going to be sort of lost uh, and we want to be able to come back to it into the future. So we do have to solve it. And if you're watching any of sort of the data center activities uh, at the moment, they're building data. They can't keep up with, with yeah. building data centers. Uh, so eventually, I don't know what I'm going to do with with my uh, stocks for in data centers, but uh, you might have to be looking at DNA next-gen storage technology, I think. Yeah, I think you, you made a really good point there about the fact that, you know, people are still, and we've totally seen this, where, and I've, having created and sort of been part of productization when, in my previous life of backup services and offerings, right, um, initially, people were happy to buy 100 gigs of storage space, and then it was a terabyte, and then it's 10 terabytes, and now it's a petabyte. It's grown more than exponential in terms of what people need to store, not only because of the data is growing and what we're creating in terms of you know, creating more video content, more rich data that just needs more space, um, but we're also with compliance and regulation and security needing to store that for longer because of X. I mean, I remember even... 10, 15 years ago, doing email archiving and people were saying, oh, we need to keep our, our, our data for seven years. And even then I was like, seven years, really? Yeah. Um, a few years ago, it was 99 years and now it's, it's, it's all together. But the key point there, I think, is when you've got the data there sitting almost for nothing, you know, you want to put it into long-term parking as such, you have to make that valuable to the customer still because they're still paying for it. So being able to activate the data, you know, data reuse, we're very big at that with Veeam. We're, we're starting to, you know, release features where you can actually dig into that data that's stored there so it presents some value to you as a customer. So it's not just sitting there just in case of disaster. So that's an important mindset mm -hmm. to, to look at when you're thinking about a data protection company as well. And my background was uh, also in video, so the CCTV sector and just watching that move from sort of the analogue, the old VHS tapes, and then moving that into uh, that storage. And again, 10 years ago, a terabyte was very, very costly. Mm. Uh, and then once that storage opened up, it allows things like video analytics to play. And I just did a session yesterday with Seagate um, and their uh, hard drives, their Skyhawks, actually. I'll give them a plug. They're sponsoring. Mm. Um but yeah, the Skyhawks uh, and, and specifically built hard drives to run that analytics. So, you know, oh, yeah. it's it's still recording, but also uh, performing the analytics in the background so as well. Are they building the smarts into the into the drive itself? Yeah, inbuilt into the drive with with health monitoring too, as well. Yeah. Because obviously there's power control and heat control there as well. So really advanced technology uh, in that storage sector. So it's a really interesting space. Look, let's, um, we could talk all day and I think we've probably got, I'm going to bring John back on and we're going to just talk about the market generally. Let me just bring on my next slide. 
Hang on. Here we go. And, John, I'll bring you back. Thank there you. There you go. Better get going. That was fascinating. I've just sold on my uh, data center stocks, by the way. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm, I've got a couple on my watch list, and now I literally it's like, well, how long are they going to keep going for? Exactly. Um, and we can talk about just general, I, I, maybe back to you, John. What are you seeing in, in sort of storage and the backup space? Yeah. Any, any no. sort of... Contribution uh, it's there. fascinating and it's something I sort of mentioned before. Uh, the final stage of any cyber capability and thinking is instant response. Uh, it's not if but when it's going to happen. You need to have a plan what to do, you know, how to deal with the incident, how to, uh, but then importantly, how to recover. And yeah. uh, incident response, disaster recovery, business continuity and crisis management are all interlinked requirements for any organisation. And the number of times we are in that that twilight zone of sort of recovery uh, is uh, it's weekly at the moment with clients yeah. and we see the ups and downs of how good uh, you, you know backups uh, actually work and the whole ransomware market is funded at the moment by people who are willing to buy or pay for, for getting the um, keys back um, if you know if their recovery is better uh, then they can simply keep their business going so it is a very key part of the very other important word you mentioned which was resilience and I think yeah. uh, I think that's business is just going to grow Anthony maybe on that and I know you're a, 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 a you're obviously across cyber security as well how and we've talked about before with that sort of breaches and getting the escalation rights and often they do get into the backup aspects yep. as well and they, they uh, compromise the backups where, where does veeam sit with that like what what's the air gap there if there is one what's the protection on the backups yes it's all it's really become about immutability it's been the key word for the past two years and as a focus and you know being able to not only air gap but also create some sort of lock on the on the storage or on the data when it actually sits and, and lands on the backup repository so from a technology point of view, um, the public cloud has been great with that. Um, Amazon introduced object lock and versioning onto their S3 object storage. So we've been able to leverage that to basically, you know, effectively say that when you do actually place your data, when it sits on that S3 repository in what we call our external, repo well, not external repository, our um, native repository, our, from, on our Scala backup repository, um, it's going to sit there and not be changeable by anybody, even the root administrator, even a... AWS root administrator as well. So that's one thing. Um, in V11, we're taking that a little bit further. We're introducing the concept of, uh, of a Linux-based immutable uh, primary repository as well. So, you know, immutability is where we're looking at. But also, even years ago, we were talking about the benefits of, say, using a cloud provider um, to basically do an off-site backup. So 3, 2, 1 rule of backup, have one copy of your data off-site effectively and somehow create that air gap so if a actor gets in and they want to do some malicious intent then they're going to have a hard time getting to that offline location and that's a key as well great i'm really glad we brought up storage it is a it's a fascinating critical area uh and we could literally go on and like 45 minutes are just flying by so <laughs> we're gonna have to close it off um let me just bring up so canalyst came out and i imagine both of you would kind of uh, get your thoughts on this. I'm just going to bring this up. So cybersecurity will grow by up to 10% in 2021 as the range of threats broadens, yeah. new vulnerabilities emerge, and the frequency of attacks uh, increases. So let me just get rid of the thing. Um, and US billion. So we're now up at uh, 60 billion expected this year. Yeah. Worst case scenario, 57 billion. So I think we're in the right market. Yeah. And there's one more... Uh, multi-layered solutions vital. So these are, uh, what was the strong one here? So web and email security will be mm. the strongest, mm. uh, but they're all up there, really. Data security at the bottom there. Yeah. What were we talking about? Storage. There's no storage here. Yeah. That must be data security. Yeah. Sorry there, Anthony. You're the, <laughs> the lowest <laughs> one, I imagine. I find it interesting that network security is actually so low. Uh, yeah. being, being, being the front office, effectively, the front door to everything, yeah. right? That's quite an interesting one there. I think that's going to come back, that one. Um, just by the way, just make sure that my bosses are not listening because we're in budget and target setting mode. So uh, 
uh, if they're listening, it's much lower than that. But I'd agree with those numbers. Uh, we, we are definitely seeing that. It's definitely slowed a little bit down because of COVID. And we're, you, you know, it depends which vertical we're talking about. The universities probably will slow down a bit just because of the reality yeah. of their verticals. But um, yeah, the, they are definitely the, the areas. We mentioned uh, web and, you know, that sits in the application space as well. We're seeing huge growth in the in the application space. Uh, uh, our company, White Hat's a SaaS provider, and uh, just sort of uh, booming at the moment. Um, so, and the other one's identity. You know, the zero trust models are requiring very good identity uh, structures at the moment. Where are you seeing the market in to sort of Pam? We covered a lot with Pam. Um, so, because it's a it's a we always call it. I hate the word, but journey. It's always a journey to int introduce yeah. to Pam. Uh, Sort of approach in a large enterprise. Is there many underway? How advanced or mature would you say privilege access management is in the market? It depends on who you're talking to. Uh, it is <laughs> definitely a. It's definitely occurring. Uh, the more mature organisations that have invested, uh, probably invested early in the pre-COVID phase of these sort of SaaS models. Yeah, you know, which is the endpoint and the and the application and sort of figuring it out from there are well ahead of the games and 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 definitely implementing PAM privilege access management uh, because that's the name of the game. The previous conversation around evasive is all about escalated yeah. privileges, and so many organisations don't have that fine grained approach uh, that you just can't do without these days. So uh, it's it's growing uh, in the market here. Great. Well, look, gents, thank you so much. Um, Anthony, we'll have you on again, I think, uh, next time, well, maybe after version 11 comes out as well, yeah. um, but also on a sort of a deep dive into what you see. And I really appreciate sort of highlighting DNA and next-gen storage. I think it was a great, great topic. Uh, and also, John, we'll keep an eye out for any of these interesting sort of takeaways from the monthly reports on NTT. Sounds good. Thank you. So, look, Thanks, guys. Uh, we're going to keep no that just under the hour and we'll release this as a podcast as well on the Cybersecurity Weekly podcast. Uh, but that was us on MySecurity TV. So I'll keep you on screen, gents. And next uh, next Tuesday is Australia Day, so we're not going to do uh, an episode. Next Friday, uh, I'm just finalising a guest from Washington and we'll have a look at uh, what the perspective is for the Asia-Pacific uh, from the eyes of someone in the US. Uh, and then on the following Tuesday, the 2nd of February, we're going to be diving into semiconductors. We've got Professor James Rabel from the University of Sydney. And I've just had a confirmation from, uh, we've got a, a, an actually a listed company that's in quantum computing uh, and quantum networking, I think, uh, on encryption. So uh, they've just confirmed this morning and I'll uh, get the slides up. So that's on the 2nd of February. So look, that's us. Uh, from MySecurity TV and the MySecurity Marketplace. Uh, John Carabin and Anthony Spatieri, thank you so much there at Canberra and in Perth. No worries. Appreciate your time. And uh, thanks to GC, our only comment. So we've got to start getting some likes. Okay, thanks, guys. Cheers. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.